السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم احسن ویلکم سی یو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان وی آر گیٹنگ ان ٹو لیکچر نمبر ٹوینٹی ایٹ آف دا برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور ان دا پریویس لیکچر اگر وی ٹاک اباؤٹ برانڈنگ پالیسیز اینڈ اگر دا برانڈ آرکیٹیکچر وچ ڈفرینٹ کمپنیز امپلائی ان آڈر ٹو برانڈ دا پروڈکٹس We were almost done with the concept, but uh, there are uh, a couple of uh, classifications which need to be discussed further in order to complete our understanding of uh, what the concept is. Uh, just to give you a recap, uh, we talked about the relationships that uh, the companies uh, develop between their brands and different products that they sell on the market. Brands get into relationships with different products in order to draw distinction between them and among them. The distinctions which are drawn with the help of uh, the relationship that a brand has with its product helps consumers and customers to make their decisions easily because they know one product from the other and therefore they become fully aware of the properties, of the attributes, the benefits, and values which different brands offer. This kind of relationship between a brand and a product also helps companies to organize their production systems and marketing systems around those products. You can well imagine the hassles which companies would be running into if different products did not have different names. It would be hard to organize their production systems and also selling those products in the marketplace. There would be no distinction. These relationships are basically classified into six different branding policies. And that is what we learned in the previous lecture. We completed our understanding on uh, four branding policies, with the meaning four different kinds of uh, relationships with which the brands develop with uh, the products. Product brand strategy, uh, the line brand strategy, the range brand strategy, and umbrella brand strategy. Those are the four strategies that we discussed in the previous lecture. Uh, before we move on to the source brand strategy, uh, let us uh, make the one thing very clear that uh, these are the systems uh, with which uh, really allow us to look into uh, why companies develop different kinds of relationships with, with their products. Meaning, why is it that a company gets into umbrella branding and why is it that a company gets into range branding or for that matter, why is it that a company gets into source branding strategies? We're now getting on to classification number five, which is uh, source brand strategy. Source brand strategy is uh, very close to the umbrella brand strategy. Uh, the difference is that uh, you have different uh, sub-brands under one source name. If we draw a distinction between the two strategies, uh, you will recall that Umbrella is uh, just one brand name. And that name is given to all the sub-brands or all the brands uh, which form the total range or which form the total extension of the same brand. Under the source, uh, you have one source name. And under that name, uh, you have different sub-brands. And all those sub-brands could have different names. So in other words, this is kind of a two-tier or a double-level branding strategy in which you have a very strong source name and you also have very strong sub-brand names. Why? The reason is that every sub-brand within this strategy fulfills one promise. And every brand comes into being with a rationale, uh, which means that it fulfills a very distinct need and which in turn means that it carries one set of promises and those promises get translated into a very uh, distinct kind of a contract and that contract uh, is upheld by the company under this branding strategy. To give you one example of this strategy, I would draw your attention toward the Japanese cars. You think of uh, the most of the uh, major car manufacturers from Japan Uh, you may look at uh, the manufacturer T or manufacturer S or manufacturer H. But all those companies have the one source of the brand name, which is a very strong brand name. 
And under those different names, you have so many different sub-brands. What happens is, um, when a company starts doing business, um, it starts doing business with one brand name. In the process, when that brand becomes very strong, it automatically, as um, a process of the evolution, it gets subdivided into subspecies. And those subspecies are defined as different with the sub-brands. And again, in the process, what happens is that those sub-brands, they become so strong because they offer a very distinct set of promises and also they have the support of the source brand. So when these two uh, strengths come together, what happens is that uh, the subspecies, or for that matter, uh, that all the individual the brands under the source and they get uh, strength, uh, meaning the cumulative strength, and uh, they become very strong in their own right. Uh, they become so strong that, uh, in the words of uh, the marketing expert, uh, they become heroes in themselves. And uh, when that happens, the source brand name takes a backseat, and uh, the sub brand name uh, comes to the, the surface, and that is the brand name which is promoted by the company. And uh, there is a uh, the whole set of uh, the communication strategies with which we should be talking about later uh, in one of the lectures, uh, which are employed in order to uh, promote that particular brand. Uh, but don't uh, forget that uh, in the process, the source brand also gets promoted because uh, everybody knows in the market that uh, the parent brand or the source brand, which is uh, behind that uh, the sub brand, uh, happens to be a very major brand. And which, of course, is the case with, uh, with most of the Japanese car models. Let us take a look at uh, the graphical illustration uh, in order to have a very clear understanding of uh, this concept. As you can see from uh, this illustration, uh, we have uh, four different uh, sub-brands uh, under the source brand. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, each brand is uh, catering to the needs of uh, one particular segment. This is where it has a lot of similarities with uh, the umbrella brand strategy. But the only difference is that uh, the brand name here is different. And uh, we have uh, the different brand name for each segment that um, different brands are uh, catering uh, to the needs of. We have uh, a very clear uh, the set of uh, the promises uh, which are compatible with um, the different segments in which all these four brands are operating. And uh, we also have um, a specific set of uh, communications for uh, these uh, brands. And uh, these brands uh, essentially are four different products. Go back to the example of uh, the cars. Just look at uh, four different models of uh, a source brand, uh, which are meant for four different target markets. I think it is very clear to all of us that uh, one of the models is meant for a very high segment. It is a high-priced uh, car, whereas the other one is for uh, the upper middle class and yet another one for the middle class and yet another one for those who uh, they just want to go for something uh, for um, um, the uh, functional purpose, meaning no frills. So this strategy basically uh, has a lot of depth and it offers companies a double level of not only branding but a double level of differentiation and depth. Because uh, when you uh, look at uh, the source brand or for that matter, whenever you realize uh, the source brand, the presence of the source brand, you relate that with the sub brand which in itself is a very strong brand so that is where this strategy uh, brings about uh, double strength in terms of uh, the branding. It is a strategy in which the family spirit in the name of the source dominates. Uh, despite the fact that uh, the source name is reduced only to a logo, I mean, if you take a look at uh, these Japanese cars, you might not find uh, the source name anywhere on the car, but you still know what the source is because there's a logo uh, in front of the car which is very recognizable. 
that's the beauty of this strategy that uh, the source becomes uh, or the source is so strong that it lends a lot of strength to the sub brand and the sub brand in its own right being very strong gains double strength so that is what it meant by a double level of strength a double level of differentiation and a double level of depth that's all for uh, the source brand strategy let us now talk about uh, the sixth classification and these classifications let me clarify are very general and uh, the most companies operate uh, within these uh, six different sets of uh, the branding policies if a company comes up with uh, something which is different from uh, these six classifications um, it has every right to do so uh, but generally companies do operate within these frameworks uh, the sixth one is endorsing brand strategy. The endorsing brand is generally the company name, uh, which takes on the uh, overtones of a brand name. Again, I would give you examples uh, from the car industry. Uh, there are companies uh, in the global market uh, which uh, have become a kind of brand names, uh, although they do have uh, the sub-brand names at the same time. The sub-brands are the real brands that people talk about in terms of uh, differentiation and in terms of distinctions, meaning in terms of the relationships which those brands have with the products which people buy. Uh, for example, Car A uh, is uh, Car A, although it uh, is uh, being manufactured by uh, one of the manufacturers uh, whose name also has become kind of a brand name, uh, but uh, uh, that brand name is uh, the one which endorses the brand which carries the promise, meaning the product which carries the promise under one particular brand name. If I give you examples by name, uh, the concept is going to be uh, very, very clear, but I think uh, without having to go into uh, naming different companies and brands, uh, the concept should be clear with the help of uh, the discussion um, uh, which we are having. There are Companies in the food sector also which uh, employ this kind of strategy. I can give you an example of uh, the biscuits. And uh, you don't really have to go across the national borders to look at uh, this kind of a strategy. Uh, biscuit companies uh, in our country are employing the strategy. And uh, the company name uh, is a very strong uh, endorsing name in this uh, the kind of a setup are under you know, these circumstances, whereas every different brand of biscuits uh, carries a different promise. This branding strategy covers a range of uh, the different products uh, which uh, uh, are offered in the shape of uh, product brands, in the shape of uh, the line brands, and in the shape of uh, range brands. We have products, we have brand names, we have segments, and we have the same markets. The only question is, what is the naming strategy that we should imply so that we can go for the right most brand architecture when it comes to drawing distinctions between different products? So please do not uh, be confused uh, among the different strategies which you are going to imply when you get into the practical field. We are dealing with uh, the same market and uh, the same products, like I said earlier. It only is a question of uh, being very careful uh, about your strategic intent and being very careful about the segments which you are trying to target and being very careful about the uh, product promise which you are going to deliver. Uh, the strategy which you think is uh, the most uh, the suitable one under the circumstances uh, of the marketplace and under the circumstances um, of uh, consumer behavior and under the circumstances of um, the, the, the competitive situation, whether you have to imply that. The six models that we have discussed are the typical cases of uh, the branding strategies or branding policies, uh, which are employed by different companies um, as uh, the brand architecture. The most important question here is, uh, which is uh, the strategy uh, which we should imply? And like I uh, talked about that earlier, uh, there is no uh, the one particular uh, the set of um, uh, strategies or one particular strategy uh, which you should be employing under one set of circumstances, meaning there is no uh, one answer to this uh, the question. 
uh, this question uh, has so many different answers and answers relate to the set of circumstances you are surrounded by in terms of your competitive situation, in terms of your consumer behavior, and in terms of your product characteristics. Uh, there is no list of the do's and don'ts that do this and you'll be successful, don't do that and you'll be successful. It is not a question of that. There is no one fixed model. Uh, it is something very serious. It is something very strategic and uh, it has to be viewed in relation to the situation which I just talked about. The meaning three elements of uh, the market are extremely important while making uh, decisions about brand architecture and those are the consumer, uh, the, the product and um, the competitive position. The consumer, because you have to know who the consumer is, and that brings you back into the area of segmentation. Uh, you know, that also brings you back into the area of consumer behavior. And from there, you get on to the set of promises that you have to create and the set of promises that you have to deliver. A competitive situation, because it is here that you have to uh, determine where your brand um, stand in the marketplace, meaning how it stacks up against competition. And um, it is a situation where you um, really have to be very, very uh, accurate about uh, your product benefits, um, which are to be delivered. It is because of the totality of circumstances and the totality of uh, the factors the strategic factors which I just uh, talked about that uh, the companies decide about their brand architecture. In most of the cases, the companies have uh, the one particular uh, branding policy which that company follows. There also are cases where companies uh, go for kind of a hybrid uh, model which is uh, the combination of uh, more than one branding policy. And why that company does that? It again is in response to the set of strategic circumstances um, which the company finds itself uh, surrounded by. So therefore, the brand architecture is uh, a reflection of uh, the, the marketing strategy of uh, a company under one particular set of circumstances. It is not something whimsical. It is something which is highly thought through and it is something which has a very deep background and based on that background, you move uh, from step to step and from one phase to another. And by the time you are involved into the architecture, you have all the considerations, meaning the strategic considerations uh, before you um, in order to make the right most decision. With this, um, our learning about uh, brand extensions, uh, the brand portfolios, and uh, strategic branding policy, meaning the brand architecture stand concluded, and uh, which means that uh, we have covered uh, the one more uh, step uh, within phase three of uh, the brand management process, as is clear from this uh, the graphical illustration, which explains the whole thing very clearly. From here, we now get on to another topic, which is about channels, meaning the marketing channels which companies use in order to reach its consumers or its customers. We have been talking about these two terminologies, the meaning consumers and customers interchangeably, but uh, here in the context of channels, let me clarify before I proceed further that uh, we should be using the terminology customers uh, for the intermediaries, the meaning uh, your dealers, your distributors, the retailers, and the terminology of a consumer uh, for the ultimate consumer, uh, meaning the one who buys your product for ultimate use. Uh, whereas the brand architecture has been all about brand product relationship, channels is all about uh, brand market relationship. In order to be able to get to the ultimate consumer, we have to have so many different channels uh, to pass through before we reach the ultimate consumer. There are situations in which we get to the consumer pretty um, quickly, meaning in quite 
a very direct fashion, but there are situations and mostly there are situations in which we get to the ultimate consumer through uh, so many different layers and those are the layers that we call channels. This is uh, a very, uh, one of the very basic concepts that uh, you must have learned in your uh, the basic marketing course and I have no intention here to uh, go back and start scratching the, the concept in its uh, the very basic nature um, assuming that uh, you know what channels are I basically am going to talk about how to leverage your brand with the help of the rightmost channels meaning uh, what are the kind of channels that we must have in order to be very effective in the marketplace uh, in reaching our consumers and customers of course and uh, how to make the whole process cost efficient because there's a cost to everything we reach our consumers uh, with the help of uh, the intermediaries we have to give the margins uh, we have to incur money on transportation meaning logistics that we have to spend money on warehousing and uh, we uh, have to spend a lot of money on overall inventory management developing different models that really allow us to leverage our brand and that's what the whole discussion is all about and uh, you know very well that leveraging basically is gaining advantage for one particular situation so what it means is how to gain advantage um, of uh, the channel members that you end up giving power to your brand let us now talk about that in um, a little detail unless you know we have means uh, of uh, reaching the ultimate consumer uh, which i have talked about we just cannot be successful in the marketplace in any of our the marketing efforts every the member of the channels has a specific role to play so in other words it is the multiplicity of uh, roles or the functions which are to be performed uh, between the point of production and the point of consumption that there is no one company which really can specialize in all those roles even if a company can specialize the cost is going to be astronomical and the complexity of the function is going to be quite very difficult to handle and therefore uh, there are different people meaning there are different channel members with who specialize in different roles meaning different functions and all those functions put together help us in marketing of a brand and bringing up a brand uh, close to the customers and really getting our brand into the hands of the final consumer in most of the cases as you know very well it is the retailer uh, who performs the final function meaning where the brand finally gets into the hands of the ultimate consumer so from that point of view retailers have become very important and retailers have been very important uh, this is an area which relates power of for the different channel members and I shall be talking about that uh, in, in one of my later lectures uh, but uh, just what what is to be remembered and what is not to be lost sight of is the fact that uh, there are certain uh, channel members who are um, at times a little more important than the others meaning that they have a little more power than the others so the strategy here for us meaning brand managers is how to use that power and how to uh, capitalize on that very function that the whole channel ends up gaining advantage with all of that power and uh, gaining profitability with all of that power which basically should be uh, diluted and which should be distributed among different members of the channel so our discussion is going to uh, be focused on how to uh, use channels in order to leverage of a brand so that our brand ends up being powerful now the question is if uh, we have um, distributors could we have wholesalers and we have retailers or in certain cases could we have dealers in the meaning we have in you know, so many different hands um, our products and our brands go through and at every stage and phase uh, the ownership is changed um, 
and it, it keeps changing until the time the brand gets into the hands of uh, the ultimate consumer the way it is consumed. So the question here is, again, a very strategic question. How many hands uh, should be there uh, to make sure that our brand is going to be leveraged and the brand is going to gain the right amount of power which it deserves and which it should get in the marketplace? The answer to this question um, is, again, not fixed. As we all know, uh, there are not many, many absolute answers when it comes to the marketing strategies. Uh, it is the set of circumstances and it is a set of so many different strategic options and considerations uh, that uh, we must uh, look into before we make a final decision about many of our marketing actions. In uh, this particular case, we have to be very clear about the product market relationship because while looking into channels what we're doing is we are studying the brand market relationship so the nature of the product market relationship is very important uh, in terms of uh, consumer products in terms of uh, specialized products and in terms of the special applications with which uh, those specialized products carry so, in other words, we've got to be clear about the kind of product that we are dealing in before we can make the decision about the uh, channels that we think that we should be having for our brand. And these, of course, are all very strategic options. I talked about consumers and consumer products. If we're dealing in consumer products it means we are dealing in something which basically offers convenience and which has to be available uh, in a very widespread fashion. So when you talk about consumer consumables, it goes without saying that uh, the uh, structure of the channels is going to be pretty much comprehensive and uh, there are going to be so many different members because the function is pretty much complex and um, it is huge in its um, scope. Whether you have to have a lot of distributors covering all the population pockets all over the market. And the market is not only regional, it is national. And in many cases, it is not only national, it is international. So if it is a question of uh, uh, consumer consumables, you're going to have you know, one particular set of channels. If it is a question of uh, specialized products, uh, for example, look at the medical supplies or uh, the scientific equipment, or for that matter, the very highly specialized uh, construction equipment, uh, the kind of equipment you see the while uh, the roads are being uh, constructed and uh, when bridges are being made. Uh, so those are the kind of equipments with which uh, need very different kinds of channels. Um, those channels may not be as comprehensive in terms of layers as you have channels for consumer consumables, uh, the, but uh, those channels have their own significance. Uh, if you have um, specialized products like the construction equipment or the medical equipment, the scientific equipment, um, so many different things which really must be flashing into your minds, uh, you have to have somebody who really can impart training uh, and, and knowledge about those products that you are selling. And uh, it is there uh, that you have um, the uh, importance of the function of uh, CRM, uh, Customer Relationship Management. So if you're dealing in kind of a product which uh, involves CRM and uh, which involves uh, the imparting of knowledge and training uh, to your customers, uh, you're going to have different channels. Not only are you going to have different channels, but you also are going to have a different kind of uh, an organization structure, like uh, you have a CRM uh, the manager uh, who's going to be in contact, in continuous contact with uh, your uh, the customers um, who are going to use that equipment. And uh, uh, that manager is going to make sure that uh, there is no communication gap and there is no, meaning there is no gap uh, between you and who um, is uh, selling the product and uh, the one who is um, 
using that product. So we have seen that uh, there are so many uh, different kinds of uh, uh, product market relationships that really uh, lead us into deciding about the kind of channels that we should have. Another option or consideration for that matter is the makeup of the segment in terms of volume constituents. What does that mean? What it means is that if you are uh, selling kind of a product uh, which um, is uh, subject to uh, that 80-20 rule, meaning the way 80% of the volume is being bought by 20% of uh, uh, the customers, then that is where uh, you must decide uh, very accurately uh, what should be the, uh, the channels of distribution. And the chances are you would like to go for a very direct channel, meaning that you may like to sell uh, that product through the company Salesforce directly to your customers, oblique consumers, to the meaning they are the people who are going to buy directly from you for their particular use. Um, an example could be uh, computers, for example. If you are a company that, that um, is really focusing on the institutional market and which doesn't really have that big a market um, in the um, consumer, individual uh, consumer uh, sector, and then you might uh, employ this kind of um, a strategy for uh, developing your channels that you have the one set of channel for the volume which is 80% and that may be a very direct channel and you have another uh, the channel or meaning another set of channel which you have for the remaining 20% because that is uh, what you call the individual uh, customer or individual consumer segment. Now that is a separate issue with why your company hypothetically is uh, doing that or uh, is into that kind of a situation in which uh, it should be um, selling more to individuals than to institutions. Uh, that uh, might be a question uh, popping up uh, somewhere along the marketing scene and uh, that has to be you know, taken um, in its own uh, strategic right, but that is not the, like, the point of discussion here. Uh, it was to give you one example, if you are into a segment which is constituted by that 80-20 rule, then you may have two different kinds of channels in order to sell the same product that you are selling to the sub-segment constituting 80% and to the sub and another set of channels which um, is uh, directed at uh, uh, the sub-segment that constitutes 20% of the overall segment. Another uh, option that uh, you may have uh, before deciding about the channels is uh, the level of growth of the segment. If the segment is uh, growing very fast, uh, then you, know, you have uh, one set of channels and in this kind of a situation, you mostly follow the conventional channels which are in vogue in the marketplace and those are the channels which are followed by most of the players, I would say by almost all the players. However, conversely, if you are operating within a segment which is not going very fast and which is sluggish only because it has become mature or due to any I mean, the given reasons then you may like to think of something which is very creative and which is very ingenious, meaning which is different from the rest of the crowd. Uh, because you might think to yourself that um, this is what is being done by everybody and still the overall segment is not growing as fast as it should or not as fast as the other segment in which I have another brand um, under one particular uh, branding strategy then you might start doing some creative things. And uh, to give you an example, you might like to get into something very direct, uh, thinking that uh, the intermediaries uh, they may not be uh, as much motivated to sell uh, the brand as the company sales force would be. What is going to be the cost and um, 
what are going to be the implications in terms of margins and profitability um, are the things which you really have to take into consideration uh, because uh, everything boils down to that you know, when you get into a marketing effort. Whether you want those profits right away or you would like to be a little patient is a different strategy or a different matter with which you have to consider separately. But um, this is um, one of the options with which you really take into consideration before deciding about the channels. Another option which uh, is uh, very, very important and which never escapes the attention of um, any marketing team and that is that decision about the channels uh, that depends to a very large extent on the uh, amount of power that your brand has and your company has. If you are a new company offering a new brand, uh, the chances are you're going to be uh, dependent on very strong regional distributors or very strong regional dealers for that matter depending on the kind of product that you are selling meaning the brand you're selling in that case uh, that, that is going to provide those distributors or dealers a lot more power uh, than the manufacturer meaning and you guys uh, but then you have to consider uh, this thing very pragmatically uh, because uh, without the help of uh, those uh, intermediaries, uh, that important function is not going to be performed. Conversely, if you are a company which is very well established and uh, which is selling a brand which is powerful, the chances are that those very distributors uh, or dealers will come to you uh, to develop a very positive kind of relationship between your brands and themselves. It is not to say that uh, it is easy for the one uh, particular member of the channel to the monopolize power. It is not that. When I talk about strong distributors, uh, it doesn't really mean that the strong distributors with the monopolize power and the whole effort in the marketplace the hinges upon them. At the same time, it doesn't really mean and shouldn't mean that uh, the power uh, is uh, centered around the manufacturer um, who's going to uh, call all the shots and who's the one who's going to define all the rules of the market and marketing. No, it is not that. It is a set of relationships uh, which are uh, exercised so that different functions in different phases and at different stages are performed uh, very pragmatically and very effectively and efficiently in order for our brands to get into the hands of the final consumers. So these are a few of the options that, um, that we have uh, to consider before we uh, decide upon the channel structure for our brands. Since the decision about channels is very strategic, as it goes without saying, we also have to consider a few areas with channels impact. What are those areas? Let us talk about that. The first one is the customer value. Channels really either enhance or reduce the customer value, meaning if the structure of the channels is effective, the customer value is going to be enhanced. If the structure of the channels is not very practicable, then the chances are that customer value is going to diminish. We have to understand what customer value is. Customer value means that the brand has to perform, meaning the set of performance that the brand carries, it must be able to deliver. And when I say that, it doesn't really mean that this thing stops at producing high quality. No. If your brand carries very high quality and it cannot be delivered very effectively in the hands of the final consumers, then the customer value gets compromised. Customer value is also fair price, meaning apart from the set of promises which have got to be delivered in any case, 
they've got to go for a price which is considered by the consumers as a fair price. If you reach the final consumers by incurring costs which are forbidding and which do not really uh, offer you a decent level of uh, margins, then the channel structure is not very effective. And what's going to happen is you're going to do something with the pricing. You're going to increase the price. And you might increase the price to a point the way it may not be considered a fair price by the customer. And there again, the customer value is compromised. The third element of for the customer value is that the brand has got to be delivered in the most effective way to the final consumer. Again, meaning that the distribution of the brand or the availability from that point of view of your brand has got to be very effective. Your consumers should not get into a feeling that the availability is poor and therefore we should no longer be considering this brand because a competitive brand also offers similar kinds of benefits and uh, there may be uh, you know differences here and there but uh, it is not all that bad. So that affects your customer base. So in other words, it is the uh, performance of the brand, it is the fair pricing, and you can say it is the level of service with which you have to provide to your consumers with which form the overall customer value. Now, what if you're dealing in uh, consumer durables? You know, you've got to provide your uh, customers and consumers with uh, after-sales service. And you cannot do that unless you have right to the most kind of channel structure. We're going to talk about those things uh, in detail uh, later also, but uh, this is what is meant by customer value, and this is the one area which is very seriously impacted by the channels that you have uh, to sell your brand. So, one just one element in isolation cannot really make sure that customer value uh, is very high. Until the time that we have all the elements that I've talked about in place, the customer value is going to remain compromised. So before you make decision for the rightmost channel, you've got to look into this area which is impacted by the channels. Because it is all about deciding uh, who are the people or who are the companies or who are the members of uh, the, uh, the channels or you know, who, who comprise the supply chain. And wherever you think there are missing links, you're going to hurt your brand. So that is what the whole thing is all about. The customer value has got to be delivered and in order to do so, you've got to make sure that the chain of supply of your brand is absolutely impeccable. Another area which is impacted by channels is sales revenue. Why is that? Well, that goes without saying that with the prime objective of developing an effective distribution outreach, the marketing channels determine the number of existing and potential customers. The total number of customers is the basis of revenue. Now, what it means is that uh, if you are uh, selling a consumer consumable, naturally you have to go to uh, all the markets within the country if we are talking about the national market. And in order to uh, be able to do so, uh, you've got to have so many distributors and uh, you've got to have uh, so many wholesalers and retailers uh, because you would like your brand to be in so many different hands. You would like to increase the number of people who are using your brand. And more the number of people, the more the sales and more the sales revenues. So this basically relates the uh, locations. Uh, and locations have got to be created. In other words, the locations have got to be created by you and your company which are preferred by the customers and which are meaning by the consumers. Again, you see, this goes without saying when we talk about channels that you've got to 
uh, create locations where people are going to come uh, easily and in a convenient way, meaning locations which are preferred by your target market. And it is because of the fulfillment of that need on part of your consumers that you go to so many different markets. And it is because of that that you get into so many different hands. And the more number of hands that you can get your brand into, the higher the sales and higher the sales revenues. So this is how uh, distribution channels impact the area of sales revenues. The third area which is impacted by the channels is the profitability. Naturally, when you uh, try to improve the outreach, because you would like to have a very effective outreach, you are incurring costs. Costs factor in in the shape of the margins, in the shape of logistics, like I pointed out earlier, I think, and in the shape of the warehousing and uh, the inventory management. You need to have uh, the very good staff uh, which is uh, handling uh, uh, distribution, uh, the form the distribution points and they've got to get into so many different kinds of uh, the latest inventory models, uh, computer aided inventory models. Uh, you, so in other words, you need to have uh, the very uh, knowledge able uh, the people, in other words, knowledge workers who are working in different areas just in order to make sure that the product which you are selling gets into the hands of the final consumer in the most effective way and also in the most efficient way. Effective in the sense that your brand has got to get into the hands of the final consumer in the most effective way, meaning it's got to be available all over and the consumer doesn't really have to walk an extra mile, so to say, in order to find your brand. If your brand is very good and it offers very good customer value, the customer might do it once, the customer or the consumer might do it twice, but the consumer may not do it the third time because it is a hassle if it is not really available everywhere. So you lose effectiveness. And efficient in the sense that uh, it's got to be cost efficient. You've got to reach all those consumers with uh, a cost level uh, which is bearable by the company and which is very much in line with the contribution margins that you have worked out. Now, this is not an area uh, which is going to be the part of the brand management because this is going to be taken care of within the uh, financial the management uh, the ambit. Uh, but then you've got to have a very clear understanding of, uh, of the margins which must come um, to the company uh, because that's what your marketing effort is all about. So we can say that uh, three areas, meaning uh, customer value, sales revenues, and profitability are important strategic areas which are impacted by your decision as to which channels that you should go for. And before you make that decision, of course, the consideration of these three areas is going to be of paramount importance. These three areas could also join hands with another factor which is very important, and that is the factor of historical background. Of course, the strategic considerations are of the paramount importance. But then at the same time, the way your company has been working over the past two years and uh, the way developments took place also got to shape up the relationships that you have with uh, different members of the channel and the relationships that have been developing and shaping up you see, over uh, the last you know, few decades or even you know, more than that. So historical background also plays a very important role and uh, it is in conjunction with uh, the other uh, strategic options and considerations which are talked about that you finally decide which should be the shape of your the channels to sell your brand. Now all this means that uh, to sell one product you may have two different kinds of channels. I'm not saying that you must always have uh, that. All I'm saying is that there is a possibility. You know if you go back to the rule of 80-20, if you go back to the rule of uh, the individual consumers versus 
institutional consumers and where your strength is, okay, depending upon the appeal that you have for one particular segment and an appeal for another segment, okay, which, is, which may not be very strong in terms of your brand and your company, you make all these decisions. Having said that, let me now take you to a graphical illustration which makes the whole concept very clear. If you take a good look at uh, the illustration, you will see that we have basically two parts. Uh, the one is red and the other is blue. Red is company X and blue is company Y. But what is important about uh, this illustration is that both the companies are trying to reach the same customers, meaning they are operating within the same market. I mean, not only the same market, but also within the same segment. Company X is reaching its customers in a very direct fashion. And even that directness has two different uh, methods. So the one is that the company is reaching through its own outlets, and the other is that the company is indulging in direct sales. Whereas Company Y is trying to reach its customers through three or rather four different ways. It has direct sales as one of the selling policies or strategies. It also has the mixed systems, meaning a combination of direct and indirect, meaning it is selling direct to customers and it also is selling to the same customers through its dealers. And then this company also has another channel which is very indirect, meaning it is reaching its customers through distributors and then retailers. Why is that? All these uh, variables could have uh, an impact on the strategy of the company when it comes to deciding what kind of channels the company should have. So what is important for you to understand is that all these strategic options and considerations have got to be studied very carefully before the decision on the channels is made. There are a few more very important areas that have to be learned before we fully, uh, if not master, uh, understand the concept of uh, the channels which, are, which we are going to discuss in the next lecture. So Allah Hafiz until that time.